The following is a program of the Santa Barbara County Education Office. To learn more, visit sbceo.org. Hi, I'm Susan Salcedo, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools, and I am so pleased to introduce my guest today, Dr. Emilio Handel, Superintendent of Guadalupe Union School District. Emilio, thank you so much for being here today. Good morning, Susan. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, and can't wait to share with the audience all about your leadership, your experiences, um, all of the wisdom that you're coming with <laughs> in terms of leading Guadalupe. But I do want to share that you are superintendent of Guadalupe Union School District, and you started July 1st, 2018. I did. Yep. And um, again, we will share all of those experiences and what your the experiences thus far and what you're looking forward to in the future. But before we go into all of that, let's start with your childhood and where you grew up, a little bit about your family when you were a kid, right. and what schools you attended. Certainly. So I was born in Santa Barbara, raised in beautiful Carpinteria, lovely, small uh, beach community. Went to school at uh, Catalino Elementary, then uh, went to Maine School, mm -hmm. formerly Maine School. Now right. it's a fa the Maine Family Project. Uh, part of the Thrive Initiative. Uh, then I went to the junior high at the time. We still refer to it as, as the, the junior, junior high, high, but now it's a middle school mm -hmm. and went to Carpinteria High School. So it was a uh, typical Carpinteria uh, um, growing up background with uh, the beach always there and, and having a lot of uh, friends, mm -hmm. diverse group of friends growing and up. Do you have siblings? I do have siblings, of course. Uh, I have three brothers, one sister, um, and my brother, my youngest brother, and my sister still live in town. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my, my, my uh, two younger brothers have passed. Um, my parents uh, have also passed. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that about yeah. your background and where you grew up. And um, in speaking with you before, we've talked about your experiences as a student in school right. growing up. And for you, it really, those experiences really translate into something now as a school leader. But let's talk a little bit about how school was for you as a child. So I didn't have the ideal um, home life. Mm -hmm. um, and growing up in Carpinteria, while it was a small community, there were things going on in, in my life and ways that I tried to engage at school that, that really didn't, school didn't fit what I wanted it to be. There were a lot of needs that I had. Um, I grew up not really seeing people that looked like me or had my experiences or at least never expressed that to me. Wonderful, caring people. I can't take that away from them, but never really a person that I was able to connect with uh, both um, as, as a young Latino student and especially one that was living in the conditions that I was living in. Mm -hmm. um, however, there were some great folks that I, I did meet along the way. Um, one is obviously my coach, mm -hmm. uh, Lou Panazon, who has been just wonderful to me. He, he reached out to me and was able to reach me at a level that I was at w growing up as a student in uh, Carpinteria. Uh, one of the things that sticks out about coach is he was able to highlight some of the assets that I, that I brought. And I, I worked hard and I was very competitive and passionate about football, just football unfortunately but it was something that translated to personal success and one that I really cherished. Mm -hmm. He was able to, to pounce on that and be able to maximize my talents, what limited athletic talents I did have and, <laughs> and put me in a situation where I was successful on a team of a lot of great athletes. So mm -hmm. I was able to be part of a really successful team. But more than that, what I took away from our relationship is after a very successful fall football campaign, we had won the CIO championship, we had brought home a first undefeated season in Carpinteria, that's a big deal. Yeah. But after that season, um, I had debated not returning to school. I had friends that didn't return to, to high school and didn't graduate from high school, not from that particular class that I was in, but from previous classes. And at, at the time, 
Um, I had thoughts of just staying home and maybe just working after the, the winter break. About three or four days after the winter break and I was back at school, there was a message on the phone and it was from Carpinteria High School and I listened to the message and at that time you go and you, you push the, the message machine and it was from Coach Panazon saying he wanted to meet with me, he wanted to discuss some options for me and had it not been his call, his voice, I probably would not have responded. But I did, I responded, I, I showed up at school, went to his office and he laid out a plan for me to to finish high school, which I, I barely completed, but I did. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine what my life would have been had I not graduated from, from Carpentry High School. Um, after that, I, I had limited options, so I thought, and I joined the Army. Of course, Coach Panazon was uh, in the Army, had served in the Vietnam War, and that was something that I admired about him. And I joined the Army at 17 years old and spent the next four years in the Army. Wow, that is a really great story that you're sharing and I really want to thank you for sharing that because Absolutely. the audience who, who are watching, they they might assume, you know, a superintendent, um, Dr. Handel coming in, right. taking over a really incredible district in a community that's a wonderful community of Guadalupe, might not know the story that that is behind um, you, you right. know, and the fact that there there is there was adversity, per, uh, personal, family hardships, right. and also struggles in school because it just didn't click for you. Right. But yet there was one person, and many people, but in this case, the legendary coach, right, um, who really reached out and um, changed the course of your life. It seems really did. It certainly did. Yeah, really did. He I did. think it influenced who you are and perhaps even how you lead today in terms of your schools. It does. Yeah. Um, so you went to the Army. I did. And served for four years. I did. And somehow from, the, well, tell us what happened. I don't even want to say to the audience what happened. You tell what happened. What happened after you um, were discharged from the Army? So after four years in the Army, I'm leaving as a, you know, I joined the Army when I was 17, and I leave and I'm 21, and I'm still pretty young. Mm -hmm. As a 17-year-old, I'd been to, places in the United States I obviously wouldn't have seen. I was in Germany to watch the, the wall come down and see the fall wow. of the communist regime and the Soviet Union. And I come out and I'm still just as just as lost as maybe when I, when I went in. Mm -hmm. But I did have an experience before I left the Army at Fort Drum, New York, where I was able to take a college course. It was a psychology course. And I remember just thinking, wow, this is this is all right, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And having the professor come and pull me out after class and say, hey, you know, you're actually pretty smart and uh, you should consider maybe doing this full time. Getting out of the Army, being discharged, I didn't go immediately home. I actually stood with a friend of mine who was staying in uh, uh, Colorado, who was attending Colorado State University. And after a couple months, I'd gotten a little bored and decided I wanted to come home home. Mm -hmm. Came back to Carpinteria and, and spent about a year just working and being a typical 21-year-old, or maybe a little more than typical. <laughs> and waking up one morning to the realization that um, I wanted to do more with my life. I was working for a uh, business owner who a couple times had joked about me um, and my skills and, and kind of made fun of my abilities. Mm -hmm. And I knew inside that I was capable of so much more. He had joked, he, he had gotten a degree from, from UCSB and I won't call him out here, <laughs> but it really you know, motivated me in a negative way uh, and inspired me to take that first step in enrolling in college. Right. Before we talk about college, because you had you stopped in different places, I you know, and, and graduated uh, uh, finally from UCLA, and we'll yes. talk about that. Sure. Um, but you know what it what strikes me in this particular segment of your life is I just want to make a bridge to many high school students who graduate high school maybe not knowing what they want to do or be, right. and um, there's a lot of focus right now on being college ready and right. um, career ready right out of high school, mm -hmm. and of course we prepare right. for students to be ready, right. but not all are right, ready right away, and right. it kind of tells you that sometimes there are life experiences that help shape who you then find out you want to be. Right. Right? And that's kind of Certainly. your story there. It is. And, and to be honest, I, maybe if I was ready academically, I still don't know if I would have enrolled straight into college mm -hmm. simply because 
there are other issues that you deal with going through life. You know, we're all the most recent iteration of our best selves right. every single day. That's so right. as a 17 year old leaving, uh, leaving high school, I don't know if I was prepared to take on the rigors of college and be disciplined enough to be successful at that time. And so what happened in my life is the best thing that could have happened to me. Right. Some students can enroll and have success right out the gate, but that mm -hmm. certainly was not my experience. So you entered into college, and were you a history major from the get-go? No. Did you, no, okay. No. Where did you begin, and then how did you end up? <laughs> so I ended up at Santa Barbara City College, okay. kind of flubbed through my first semester there, was on academic probation before I knew it was going on, mm -hmm. but then reapplied myself after some personal uh, experiences mm -hmm. and decided that college was the best route to open up doors for me. Totally applied myself, worked really hard, had the GI Bill at my back so that I could afford some of the things that would generally cause uh, some financial hardships. Worked really hard for the next two years and was able to be accepted to UCLA. And as a ma history major then? No. No. <laughs> no. I did it very strategically. Okay. Spoke to the counselor and the counselor at the uh, office in Santa Barbara City College mentioned that if I applied as a sociology major, that was perhaps the easiest way to get in. Mm -hmm. And so I applied as a sociology major and then I changed to history. I was, I'm always been, I've always been fascinated with history and really how it continues to repeat itself. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a cliche, but it does. It, it happens even today, you see with a populist movement and many of the thing, other things that are going on today, how things repeat themselves mm -hmm. and people being pitted against each other. And we've seen this over the course of time and history and studying it and attempting to, to have a better understanding of the patterns of our world and of, of our people gives me a better understanding of the, how things are right now and what to look forward to in the future. I think you might have just done an advertisement for students who are watching to, to then become history majors in their <laughs> colleges because they, they now right. know why it's so I, important. I, I do have to mention <laughs> that part of the plan of getting the history degree was to go back and coach at my form, at Is my high right? school. That was part of the initial plan. Ah, that's, yeah. that's really interesting. Well, you didn't do that, but you did become a teacher. And um, some might think that's ironic, but I think it's a real a major strength that you come with the experiences you come with and then uh, became a teacher and of course administrator. So let's let's trace the path a bit to where you are today. And can you tell us some of the roles that you've, not roles that you've played, but actually professional careers that you've had up to this point? So I've been a teacher mm -hmm. in third grade and fourth grade and sixth grade. Then I became an assistant principal in the Wyneme School District. I've been a learning director in the Oxnard School District a principal in the Oxnard School District, then became a principal of an elementary in Santa Barbara Unified, and I became an assistant superintendent in Santa Barbara Unified. Then I was the superintendent principal of Vista Del Mar, Gaviota, and just recently, as you mentioned earlier, I've been blessed to be selected as the superintendent of the Guadalupe Union School District. Fantastic. So fast you can say all the things that you've done, but all those things took so so much time and, and um, really deep work in each yes. of those positions. And I think they each led you um, to another step and now you found yourself here in Guadalupe. Right. And I have heard you describe to me that Guadalupe is truly the perfect place for you to be. And you not only feel fortunate to be in the community, I believe the community feels very fortunate to have you as the leader. Tell us a little bit about why you think it is a great match. I think I have a really great understanding of the issues and challenges that face the community. I also identify with the diversity there in Guadalupe. My background is a Latino and, and my father immigrating from Mexico um, and my mother being second generation. Guadalupe represents many different generations of immigrants, some that are recently arrived and some that have been there for generations. And so being able to identify what the needs are of the different generations and not to generalize that each specific generation has particular needs, but generally speaking, we know what some of the experiences are for our recent arrivals. Mm -hmm. We know what some of the challenges are for our folks that have been there for a few generations. So understanding that, being able to speak to them and, and their language, a native Spanish speaker, being able to understand 
some of the generations that no longer speak Spanish but still have s strong identity with their Latino heritage is something that I can speak to and I understand very, very well. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, that particular cultural context, there are the academic pieces that I understand as well. And, and my whole background, my whole experience has been, up until recently, a couple years, has been working primarily with students of color uh, in poverty-ridden uh, uh, communities. So being in Guadalupe now, I feel like I'm in my wheelhouse, mm -hmm. speaking my language, talking to people that I understand completely and I completely identify with and I feel that I can work with in order to create better opportunities and better results in the future. Emilio, when you talk about being in your wheelhouse, I just want you to know that your face lights up, your eyes light up. I yeah. mean, this is really, I think, a powerful time for your leadership in Guadalupe, Thank truly. You. Thank you. Um, you talk about being able to relate, right. um, being able to share identity, um, understanding culture, but also that need for um, support in student academic achievement and right. progress. And we're all really believing in continual improvement for all of us Absolutely. It, throughout the state of California, including Guadalupe. I, I want to linger just a little bit more on the uh, twinkle in your eyes around Guadalupe. <laughs> Could you right. say just a little bit of just in terms of the community, not even necessarily the school community at the moment, but um, we've together been able to go out into the community just a little bit. And when I see you out there, on a block or in front of a restaurant or in front of an entity, I still feel like you have your faces aglow, you're really excited right. about the love of the community. What, what's a couple of more things that you just love about Guadalupe? So I make comparisons. I, I, at night when I talk to my wife, I've had conversations with her, I've told her many times, you know, Esther, it feels like I'm a kid again back in Carpinteria. The mm -hmm. small community, they're very tight-knit. Everyone knows everyone, and everyone looks out for everyone, everyone's kids. I feel like I'm back there again, mm -hmm. and I feel that I have the skills, the experience to help shepherd this community, Guadalupe community, to a better future. We have some new housings, that, new, ho new homes that are being built, mm -hmm. and there is a lot of energy in the community, and I, I do, I feel so blessed to be there because there are so many great people in Guadalupe, hardworking, well-intentioned people that I know over time in the next couple years we're going to get on track mm -hmm. and be able to create better opportunities and, and higher achievement for our students. And I'm happy to be able to do it with the people that are there right now. That community has a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. I believe its future is very bright and again, feel very blessed to be there. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. My and, pleasure. And you talked just a moment ago about the people with whom you get to um, do this work, this work that you're so passionate about and so excited about. So let's talk a little bit about your team. You've got incredible people there in Guadalupe, not only in the district office, but um, teachers. You had right. a former county teacher of the year, Correct. Michelle Minetti-Smith, Smith, yes. um, along with many, many award-winning educators. So you've got an incredible team. What, what would you like to say about about those with whom you work? Well, if I start mentioning all the names, I'm going to get in trouble, so I, I won't do <laughs> Don't that. Don't do that, I can, right. I can tell you my cabinet, my assistant superintendent, and my directors uh, are very experienced. I get along well with them. They're very knowledgeable. We do things together. We sometimes disagree behind closed doors, mm -hmm. but we definitely look to do what's best for our, for our district. But as far as our staff is concerned, Again, I was walking through classrooms today. We see, I see so many hardworking, well-intentioned staff that really want to do what's best for our students. And I, I don't want to say that that's not the norm. It's just that you find people that really wear it on their sleeve, that say, yeah, I really want to do this, and if I could get some training in that, and I really want to do that. And that is a common thing of folks that are yearning for more knowledge for more experience for more training to ensure they're giving their students the best and you can't you can't teach that that's not something that you can evaluate into someone it's something that has to come from within them and collectively that's the feeling i get from our staff
That's fantastic. I really love that. And as you said, you were in classrooms today. Right. You're so proud of your team, your teachers, um, and you're really focused on student achievement. I am. Uh, can you say a little bit about what might be some of the goals or plans that you have around the area of student achievement for Guadalupe? It's not a specific goal, mm -hmm. um, but I would say our plans, my plans this year, is to engage our stakeholders in the process of improvement. What does that look like? You know, many times we'll just throw a bunch of things up on the wall and see what sticks. We're going to try this, we're going to try that, we're going to try this program and try that program. And things are not done in a matter that's coherent and certainly not effective and not a good use of taxpayer funds. So we want to work with our staff to make sure we develop a plan. We first understand what our problems are and develop a plan collaboratively so that we can implement it with fidelity and everyone buys into what we're doing and go through that process, see how our plan turns out, mm -hmm. take a look at data, and do that process over again. It's, it sounds very simple, but because of the human dynamic and the social dynamic involved, it can be kind of tough, but I believe we have the right people to start engaging in that process of what you mentioned, continuous improvement. That's, right. That's what we want to establish as a culture mm -hmm. in Guadalupe of continuous improvement. That's great. So really engaging stakeholders, Correct. looking at student engagement, looking at what works and maybe what doesn't work right. at the moment and really looking at data to inform decisions and continually grow, a long-term goal. Correct. Um, and in terms of a, a culture uh, in Guadalupe. That's right. And there are multiple tracks. There always are in terms of being an administrator and superintendent. You're looking at achievement. You're looking at community. So many different tracks that you're looking at. Right. One is in Guadalupe uh, School District, there are many projects that are occurring or have just occurred. Do you want to highlight a few that have just occurred or are occurring in the district <laughs> yes. of a hundred. We've, we've <laughs> had a few. So some of the significant projects have been we recently completed an eight classroom building that was basically thrown up over the course of six months on the campus. There was nothing there before so laying down a, a, a concrete and throwing the building up over the course of, of a few months, which is really quick in construction. Mm -hmm. That was one piece to it. We also moved our fifth graders from our elementary school over to our middle school, and now it's an intermediate school. We also are working on plans for a new school in the future. We also have plans for a school gymnasium that we're going to be bringing forward for a proposal this month. So there's a lot of projects that we have to stay on top of and coordinate and make sure that we're doing the right thing and we're spending money the right way and, and we're, we're working with people that are going to be able to complete these projects in a manner that's efficient and both effective. And is this a sign, are those projects a sign of population growth in Guadalupe? Um, perhaps simply a, a sign of needing to modernize in Guadalupe? Or is it a combination of many things in terms of the eight new classrooms, um, fifth graders moving over, a new class, a new school? Right. Um, what, how would you, where do you point to in terms of why that needed to occur? I would point to letter D. Mm all of the above, <laughs> okay. right? So we do have uh, a anticipation of increased population in the area. We just recently completed an enrollment project projection five years and ten years and what we noticed is that our enrollment's gonna double in perhaps ten years. Mm -hmm. So we have to plan for that. Everything that we're doing right now, we're trying to do it in anticipation of our population doubling over the next few years. Mm -hmm. So when we start projects and we look at projects, we look at it through that lens so that we don't look five, ten years down the line and say, you know, what were we thinking? Right. So Emilio, you know, as we, we've talked about your experiences as a student, your pathway to how you got to where you are today, right. one thing I didn't share um, with the viewers today is that in you know, those experiences, you've obtained really earned two master's degrees and a doctorate in education. I mean, you are somebody who now looking can look back and say, you know, you really earned each of those um, aspects of your 
uh, profession professionalism. And so I will make an assumption, and I know you, so I can make this assumption, which is you are, really are a lifelong learner. I mean, you really do learn and seek to learn and improve. So my question to you is, as a leader of, a, of an incredible um, district that you are, are in, how do you continue to hone your leadership skills and continue to push and learn and grow as a leader uh, for your district, but also for your team? So I'll point to two personal attributes of mine, which is curiosity and humility. Mm -hmm. um, curiosity that I, I want to know more. If I know more, maybe I'll do more. And that's what my belief is. So constantly seeking workshops, looking online, speaking with other superintendents. I meet with other superintendents in the area. I've got a network of superintendents and assistant superintendents that have a lot of knowledge in the areas that they serve. Also humility to know that I don't have all the answers and I have to rely on other people. I, I halfway joke that I have to surround myself with people that are smarter than me. And I, I, I believe that. I have to have folks that are really experts in their area and also want to continue to learn. Another aspect uh, that I might add is being competitive. Mm. Um, that's an element that, that drives me. I, I do I want, to, I want us to be better. And I, I do look at our scores sometimes as a score sheet and compare. Mm -hmm. I, I want us to be the best we possibly can be. That's an, that's an army plug there. That's a saying. <laughs> but I, I do. I want us to be one of the best districts around. Yes. And that's what I'm going to strive for through learning, through modeling, through, again, having the humility to know that I don't have all the answers, surrounding myself with a good team, and being competitive to some degree. I, I love that you just made all these connections to your past, the Army. Right. Um, I also think perhaps your football time at Carpinteria, mm -hmm. perhaps the competitiveness there, a little bit of that drive. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. But um, you're also talking about a mindset of being curious and um, having that humility, being competitive, continually to get better. And I'm right. curious, speaking of curiosity, I'm curious if you would say that that's a mindset that you want students in Guadalupe to have as well. Absolutely. We absolutely want that to happen for all of our students. But it takes some effort, right? We have to have staff that know how to facilitate that particular mindset. And it's, and it's a shift from what our traditional manner of instruction is. Yeah. As we wind down this interview and time together, I really want to give you, the leader of Guadalupe Union School District, to be able to address the students in your district, if you could, and share a message with your students. What is that message today? I would tell them what I just said earlier. Mm -hmm. Work hard, stay curious, stay humble, and chase your dreams, because you'll get there. And what about for your parents, parents of those students in Guadalupe? <laughs> Have patience, <laughs> same thing. Um, try to, to be as supportive of, uh, as you can to your children. Believe in them, mentor them, model for them. Stay engaged with the schools. Be curious and uh, be patient with us. That's fantastic. Emilio, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for your experiences, your stories, your wisdom. Uh, it was, it's been a pleasure to share this window, a peek into Dr. Handel's life, um, just for, for a little me. moment. Thank you. I'm Susan Salcido, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools. Thank you so much for joining us today for this edition of Education Matters.